Bueno, hola, bienvenidos a otra edición de El Bioinfo Club. Eh, yo soy Iván Elson y me complace presentaros a esta actividad. Primero de todo, si estáis viendo el vídeo desde la web de, de Eventbrite, podéis verlo en pantalla completa clicando en el título que hay encima del vídeo y yendo a YouTube, donde podéis poner el modo pantalla completa y escribir vuestras preguntas en el chat. Eh, hoy os presentamos a la doctora Isaac Kun Mayona, que pertenece al Departamento de Molecular Life Science de la Universidad de Zurich. Eh, ella estudió Ciencias Computacionales y Biología, hizo su doctorado sobre Biología del Desarrollo en Plantas, centrándose en métodos de cuantificación de la expresión génica, y luego se pasó a Epigenética. Y bueno, es una fiel defensora del código abierto, eh, actualmente su investigación se centra en el desarrollo de métodos eh, de regulación de la expresión génica y tecnologías de single cell. Hoy nos va a hablar sobre métodos de benchmark para el análisis de single cell, de, de single cell RNASEC, imagino. Un tema muy interesante, así que muchas gracias para estar hoy con nos, por estar hoy con nosotros y sin más dilación, te dejo que comience. Comparte la pantalla cuando quieras, quizás con. Gracias por, por la introducción, Iván. Eh, es un placer estar aquí. I'll switch to English unless you'd like uh, uh, me not to, because I think uh, we might have some some uh, um, uh, people listening to the talk with uh, uh, worse uh, uh, Spanish command. So I think I'm sharing already the screen. I'd like to uh, well to first tell you that uh, the title has two parts. Uh, or two lines that you see, but it's actually only one. It's going to be about benchmarking in many, many senses. And uh, I'd like to say that this is uh, done. It's not my work. It's my work, but it's of uh, many others and uh, it mainly led by, by Mark Robinson from the University of Zurich. So I'm just going to start this uh, the opposite way most people do. And this is the acknowledgements first. As I said, this is a teamwork. So this was mostly laid by Mark, this guy here. Uh, by Almut and uh, by um, Anthony. And part of the project actually was done for all of them for the uh, uh, meta-analysis we are going to discuss, because here we had a beautiful retreat somewhere and then we did the, the, the meta-analysis and I'm not kidding. Importantly, part an important part of the of team is also someone not from the University of Zurich, but from FMI, Charlotte. And also we have a, a lot of uh, Uh, talent from the Renku team from the Swiss Data Science Center, mostly on infrastructure. So why benchmarking? Uh, it's uh, tricky to introduce the topic. I, I'd say a, a way to, to do that is to discuss any field in our in our computational biology uh, uh, realm, uh, any subfield like single cell or any seek or anything like that. If you check on the x-axis, the uh, years, the latest uh, uh, years, And then the y-axis, the amount, the cumulative amount of tools, uh, methods that are out there, you see that this is increasing and it's non-stop. It's not going to decay. And if uh, you focus on something with uh, higher granularity, like, for instance, the spatial transcriptomics, uh, you can see it's, again, the same uh, uh, date points, in this case, uh, starting in 2021, not that far uh, ago. And maybe in the y-axis, we have less uh, papers because or, or less me methods because it's for spatial transcriptomics, but it's also a very new technique, I'd say. And again, we see this, this uh, increase that it's uh, uh, yeah very exciting. The interesting part of this is that these methods here are stratified but why they are meant to do. And in some cases, they are trying to infer cell types. In some cases, maybe cell-to-cell -cell communication. In some cases, it's about data integration. But what does it mean? If we, uh, at the very beginning, had one method of doing one of these tasks, and now we have 40, we really have a problem as not methods developers, but users our, ourselves to decide which is the method we'd like to have, right? Uh, which one should I use? If there are 40, which one is best? And this is why uh, we need to sort of figure out ways of doing that. And, and um, I don't know whether um, you have your own criteria for that. I would be happy to discuss. Maybe it's about the lab the method was developed in, the last author or the, something like that, or whether the programming language is something we like, whether it looks well packaged or something like that. 
But in some cases, we might have some assessments that are more scientific, right? More about if you simulate data, does the method perform well if you know the ground truth, for instance? So uh, for that, we need a uh, um, setting for quantifying that and for doing this process of careful evaluation in a very, very systematic manner. And this is exactly what the benchmark is. Benchmarks, as you know, um, they have different meanings in different fields. It's not the same a benchmark in finances or in, um, I don't know, in uh, CPU profiling, right? But in our field would be a comparison that it's very systematic of methods uh, to uh, find the most suitable, suitable procedure for some specific task while also understanding which are the underlying features. And these both things are very, very important. But uh, we, we were discussing that we had uh, many methods for a, a given task, whatever it is in single, the single cell field, for instance, but still, and we might have one benchmark for this systematic comparison, but it still does not fully help what do we need right, to get from a benchmark? Meaning that which are the outputs that we'd like to have from a benchmark? Maybe could be this, as we discussed, the, how fast they are, the computing time, maybe how accurate they are, maybe the false positive rate, I, I don't know. So I'd like to show a couple of uh, benchmarks on specifically the same topic. This is batch effect removal in single cells, because I think they are very, um, um, indicative of what's normally done. Typically what you have in a benchmark is sort of a list in this axis. In this case, the rows are, are the methods or the metrics, the different flavors of the, of the methods as well. And on the uh, columns, we have some sort of um, um, performance metrics, like, I don't know, memory usage and CPU usage, and maybe something that it's more related to biology or to, to stats. And someone, did quantify uh, these features and somehow uh, stratified them into, into categories like being good performers or intermediate performance or something like that. Of course, the performance is not related uh, uh, to, to the performance metric, but rather to the methods, meaning that in this case, in this particular benchmark KBET, the method is maybe not very scoring very well, except maybe in, in these two biological tasks, I guess. Um, whereas uh, maybe the first method, CMS, it's very good overall. But the interesting thing about that is that uh, if we think about that, we really don't know how the benchmark was done. And also there was someone uh, stratifying that or ma making discrete categories saying this is good or this is bad. We don't really have a lot of control here to decide this method or this, this uh, metric is better than that one, right? And even worse, if we go to another paper, because there is another benchmark paper for exactly the same problem, and this is uh, 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 not uh, that old, we might get some results that are complementary or even in some cases not even identical. Here, what do we have? Exactly the same problem. It's uh, irrelevant what this is all about. What's effect uh, removal is very tricky. But again, uh, in single cells. But what we have here are commonly used methods from the best performer according to them to the worst performer and maybe some description of the outputs like uh, what do you get out of the method maybe the inputs what do you need for for inputting uh, to the method like uh, highly variable genes or genes and stuff like that and some score that aggregates some sub scores one that maybe it's biological another one that it's maybe more statistical how did these uh, uh, benchmarkers represent the data? Like these sorts of bubbles in which the area and the color indicate uh, the, the overall uh, rank. If you rank uh, methods from being best in one and being worse in 39, meaning that the lighter the color, the better. And uh, well, the top performer for them doesn't fully match the former benchmark. This is something we could uh, discuss whether this makes sense. And interestingly, is typically a good performer for the biological conservation for some of the features people used to, to um, benchmark the method. But uh, maybe it was not so good for other aspects of, of the batch correction itself. And this poses a, a challenge here. If I had to choose a method from here, I don't know, it would be very easy for me to decide whether the top one or the second one are, are the best for my needs, right? Maybe if what I need to do is to have the 
method that it's the fastest because I need to scale it uh, very, very, very easily. Maybe I'm missing the real important information here. What, what do I mean by, by, or what I wanted to show you with this example of two uh, batch effect uh, removal uh, um, uh, benchmarks? That the community, the single cell community or the bioinformatics community are running benchmarks all the time. Sometimes they overlap and they uh, somehow cherry pick because they need to, uh, the outcomes of the benchmark, or the, the parameters they are um, considering to be important to really rank things from best sorry, so from best to worst. What do I mean by that? That the benchmarking field is sort of limited to some extent. Uh, there is a problem with interpretability per se. We have a problem with, uh, or um, advantage of having a lot of freedom. We have many ways of benchmarking, right? And um, finally, and this is more philosophical, we have a problem by the all this idea of a benchmark paper meaning that if I um, run a comparison of all the methods that are available today and I start working today, once I write the paper, it would be like uh, 12 months after in the future. And then the benchmark paper will be already outdated because probably there are better method methods by, by then that I haven't included in that benchmark, right? This is the reason why we think uh, we could uh, do better, maybe knowing how the benchmarking um, atmosphere, the benchmarking field works nowadays, and maybe extracting some, some lessons to learn or maybe to, to describe as well. So this is the reason why the, the first part of this paper will be this preprint is not that old, it's from a couple of months old. And as I said, we did that uh, while well, the whole lab uh, mostly. And uh, what uh, it focuses on the field of single cell, anything related with single cells, but this is because we, we know a bit about these methods, could be about anything. To my knowledge, computational biology is very similar in this regard, in the um, 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 strategies used for benchmarking. I mean. How or what did we do here? We got 62 benchmark papers that are out there, and I don't mean methods that had a small benchmark with them, fully, uh, um, supposedly to be uh, neutral and systematic benchmarks. And we read them and we collected 22 variables, features of these papers from, I don't know, the title or the number of data sets they used in the evaluations, whether they use simulations, how many methods did they use, whether the authors are neutral. And this is a very um, tricky uh, uh, um, variable or, or things to measure because it's a bit subjective. Have you noticed that when we publish a paper in sh selling our method, we normally compare against our competitors and always our own method rank best? <laughs> this, this is tricky. If you're running a benchmark and then you are also a method developer, probably you are not fully neutral, right? And we also evaluated that categorically from being mostly neutral to maybe being, um, I don't know, having a conflict of interest. And we checked uh, many things from licenses to workflow systems used, if any, and so on. These we did in pairs. Uh, two people did the review independently per, per paper. And then we had a uh, harmonization step. And finally, we, we got the results uh, we are going to discuss today. So a couple of numbers to, to tell you how did it look like. Criteria. Uh, we were uh, um, discussing in this uh, uh, batch effect uh, examples that criteria maybe are computing time or memory usage or maybe some sort of biological, biological signal conservation, right? So how many of these criteria did, you, did we find in our benchmarks? So in one case, we had only one criteria and in others, we had around eight, 10 um, different criteria. In terms of data sets used, we had uh, around 10, I would say, uh, typically, with some outliers with having only one data set or over 10,000. <laughs> uh, what does it mean? Uh, particularly for synthetic data, when you simulate, sometimes it's hard to know whether you have one data set or many, or it's not hard to know, it's just it's hard to define. If you simulate exactly from sampling from the same, I don't know, distribution, do you get different data sets or not? This is maybe the reason why there are some discrepancies. And finally, the methods, the number of uh, tools that were used in this benchmark also ranged from yeah, a handful to almost uh, 100. So pretty diverse set of benchmarks we had here in our meta-analysis. 
um, the most interesting uh, outcomes I could discuss uh, uh, with you, because I, I wanted to cherry pick the ones that maybe are more interesting for questions or for brainstorming, the workflow uh, language. I find very interesting that we normally code, as you know, but we also need some, I don't know, snake makes or next flows or something like that for our daily practice, right, for working. Interestingly, in most of these papers, we didn't have any workflow at all. There was no snake make, no make, no whatsoever. And even more interesting, the second top uh, category of having a workflow language was, well, we don't know because there is no code available, <laughs> which is quite interesting, right? Then we had several cases with um, R-based uh, workflows and then the most normal, I would say, workflows I could imagine, like make the traditional make or, or next flow. Again, about the code availability. Uh, another thing we collected are the licenses used for uh, the code uh, uh, for the benchmarking part. And interestingly, the code was available in some cases, but there was no explicit license, meaning that by default, by law, this code was copyrighted. <laughs> then second uh, most uh, useful was uh, MIT. Then again, we had a, a very, very conspicuous category of uh, no code uh, availability. Uh, so no license, of course. And then the, the typical uh, uh, Free Software Foundation compliant the GPL, uh, in this case, normally uh, version three, and then others like MIT, uh, sorry, uh, BSD or, or Apache and so on and so forth. Uh, we discussed uh, code availability. Um, it's an interesting fact that we saw, we did uh, detect a lack of association between uh, code availability and extensibility. Of course, if you don't have code, you cannot extend that. But imagine we wanted to rerun a benchmark that it's already published, like take their code at our method and maybe improve the benchmark with that. We found that in many cases, even though the code was available, meaning that it was completely available, all the source code was needed, was available. Why do I um, grade from one to five this? Because in some cases, only parts of the code were at any way. Imagine that even uh, if you had the whole code, you could find that if you wanted to modify that, it's almost impossible because no workflow language has been used because the code structure is a bit uh, to a spaghetti, let's say. So we found an interesting um, um, uh, lack of association between availability and extensibility, or rather we found many cases of good availability and poor extensibility. And in terms of data ins and data outs, uh, it was pretty interesting to see that if the benchmarks are the columns here, the 62 of them, and then we plot in blue uh, whether something is available and uh, in red, it's not available. We noticed that, for instance, the software versions were available for many uh, benchmarks, not for all of them, which is also quite uh, shocking that, not, that it's not available for all of them, right? But anyway. Uh, in most of them, uh, the methods were not run into any uh, container or anything like that, that maybe helped to isolate the, the software stack. And in them, well, explicit provenance was not used in any. And as for the data ins and data outs, interestingly, the input data, it was almost always available. When people ran simulations, this simulated data that was available in some cases, but not in all of them. In ha almost half of them, there, there were, were not available. But when things go wild, it's about the benchmark results. Because in most of the benchmarks, neither the performance metrics or the results of the methods or even the performance results are, are uh, in some way you could download and play with. It's just the paper, right? And to us, that was quite shocking. We I, At least I, I didn't expect this, this result. So... After that, we reasoned, um, okay, what's happening in this uh, benchmarking um, uh, current status in the benchmarking field for single cell uh, tools? Well, we find that code normally is available, not always, but doesn't mean that it's extensible and reusable. We find that the code, yeah, okay, it's uh, in terms of reproducibility, it, it, it is available, but the software versions sometimes are lacking, but okay, they are. But explicit environments, like uh, the files you need to set up a con environment or something like that, or even workflows are, are missing. We find that all the benchmarks were totally sta static. Like, as we said, uh, we take a snapshot when I start doing the, the, the paper and then it's done and I publish and I forget. Um, 
the conclu conclusions we found that um, um, most of them um, were were neutral and were not competitive, meaning that the authors were not uh, doing a benchmark to show that their method was best. But we didn't find so many that were community driven, like people from the same field really interested in gathering or in arranging a joint efforts to get a, a common tool for the community. And in terms of data, we also found that the input data, it was always available, but there this really was uh, lacking in the sense the simulations, the method results, performance results were not so. And that uh, if I'd say just by the mass of the reds by, by boxes, I'd say the open data is the worst uh, in this case. So this is the reason why we discussed, okay, the, the, the problems of the static benchmarks, that the benchmarks uh, uh, could be done in many ways for different methods, that the interpretation is also very different and uh, depends on the user and in the writer of the benchmark. But we also add a new uh, item here. I think we need uh, other community benchmarks and maybe the extensible infrastructure for, for doing them. And here I need to, to say that I like to introduce our um, prototype for, for benchmarking. But we are aware that there are others. For instance, uh, uh, Open Bench from the people from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, they are doing something very similar. The people from Open Province in Single South, they are also doing uh, something relatively uh, equivalent. But in our, um, after uh, carrying out this uh, meta analysis, we thought that we could really offer something that matches the, the um, those boxes that had a lot of red items. So uh, again, just to say that this is a teamwork, uh, mostly done by, as I said, Almut, Anthony, uh, Charlotte, Mark, and myself, and funded by the Swiss Data Science Center, and, um, and um, uh, also uh, um, done in close collaboration with the, with the um, Renko team. So what's, uh, what we propose? OK, what we propose is called Omni Benchmark. It, it's a platform or infrastructure to do continuous benchmark in a very modular way. We have models that contain data sets, and by data sets, I mean input, outputs, performance, results, anything. Methods are also very isolated. There are individual models, uh, modules, and we have metrics as well for evaluating performance, right? And all these things, they are engaged, and they can be connected with each other. So the audience, and could be many types of audience, can interact with them. We envision people running benchmarks using Omni Benchmark. We envision method developers using it. If a benchmark is running and is continuous and people can add new data to there, I could imagine a method developer trying their method even secretly. You don't need to make it public to upload their method there and check, OK, maybe I'm performing very well in this task and not so well in this uh, in another and so on. And also, uh, we consider method users to be one of uh, the audience we, we might have. The people deciding, I need to use this method or that method, given my, my, my particular uh, data or my particular computational needs, right? And we re really uh, devoted a lot of, of, um, of effort into openness and provenance tracking in what derives from where and in the fact that anyone can contribute. So how does it look like in terms of modules? We discussed that uh, uh, we are going to have um, um, items that are isolated but could be connected with each other. We normally refer to them as data, methods, metrics, and the final dashboard. And the models for us are, are rank good projects that, uh, as you can see here, well, they are not going to be very surprising. They are going to have Git, they are going to have Docker, and they are going to have a common workflow language. How does it work? Uh, with exactly that, that describes what is being done at each step, each computation, in terms of history, authorship, um, of course, the software stack, and, 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 and uh, the original data and its outputs. And for that, we make use of the, of the uh, Renku components, which are um, not developed by, to, uh, for any benchmark per se. Renku is a... Um, cloud service, I would say, and some sort of infrastructure that uh, contains many um, isolated items like GitLab, GitLFS for storing data, uh, um, uh, Docker registry, and also a lot of CACD via GitLab to populate this Docker uh, registry. 
It also runs on its cell phone Kubernetes. Um, it has uh, some ends, uh, endpoints, for instance, to use RStudio Studio or, or Jupyter Notebooks or something as interactive sessions, and also has for tracking the provenance uh, using a, a graph database or a triple store, one, one triple store backend uh, endpoint that it's called Gen uh, uh, Fuseki. So what we propose is using, making use of this uh, knowledge from our uh, uh, meta-analysis, the infrastructure from Rengu and all these pieces we de de developed uh, for this aim to um, yeah, provide a community, a system that contains already Python um, um, code to for helping to, to run uh, benchmarks, system to run the benchmarks in a way that are um, reasonable, like only you only rerun uh, new methods or uh, new data when some parameters or some uh, new data are added, right? You are not computing all uh, the things you know uh, every time. That where we also keep track of what what has been done and where with this uh, graph and this this uh, backend, and where we could also uh, depict uh, the the results in a way that it's interpretable for the users. And I'd like to discuss a bit the later because it's uh, the latter because it's it's um, it's uh, quite interesting. And here I'm going to switch fields. And uh, how do you rank, anyway, a method or a metric, or a method according to which metrics? And we uh, got stole, actually, this idea from the uh, country index. And you probably know that some people like to rank their universities, countries, or whatever, according to some scores, right? And in this case, uh, this ranks European countries, if I'm not mistaken, according to some aspects, like, for instance, uh, safety or health or environment. But of course, everyone has um, their own favorite uh, uh, weights for this uh, for this scores, right? What happens if you weight more environment than, I don't know, uh, civic engagement and maybe more life satisfaction than income? Well, the income is surprising because anyway, you get to Norway and uh, first and maybe Finland and maybe all, all the Nordic countries on top, right? So this is what we envision for our benchmarks, to have a dashboard where you have your metrics there, could be CPU usage, could be whatever the biological metric score. So then uh, people decide uh, how to wait and how to rank their methods. And how does it look like? Well, a bit like that. First, I'd like to, to, to uh, tell you that the contributors are actually Charlotte and Federico Marini. And this is a shiny app that gets deployed on each benchmark and just allows you to do more or less the same, to give an, a score of whatever the, the, the metrics, like these uh, batch effect metrics, and then to, to um, rank the methods according to them. And um, and this is all. I would say currently we are, uh, the method is, is or the benchmark uh, platform is already in production or the prototype is. We have a current uh, benchmark, of course, on batch effect removal as everyone else, but uh, continues this, this time, I hope. We are reproducing an old clustering benchmark uh, the lab did a couple of years ago to have a ground truth even for the benchmark. This is a meta ground truth. And uh, for instance, this is how would it look like for the batch effect. And this is a very uh, bad plot for a very simple uh, scenario with only uh, two methods for batch effect removal, two data sets and maybe some parameters. And as I said, we can score being red uh, good and being uh, white bad. The uh, best methods and the best parameters according to whatever the weights we add to those. For instance, we know that the, uh, the CMS score is very good as a reporter of, of uh, batch effect mixing, right? Of, um, if we'd like to emphasize this instead of, I don't know, runtime, now with this tool, we could uh, probably uh, um, learn that the best method we could use is um, harmony with uh, whatever these parameters are. You, you see? meaning that we, we hopefully provide the power to, to the methods users to, to decide how, how would it work best to pick their, their method in. So to sum up, I think I provided a very short and fast overview of the current status of benchmarking in this particular field that maybe uh, this could be extrapolated to the uh, computational biology field. Um, but there are lots of opportunities for, for benchmarking. I mean, it's an exciting field. 
And in my opinion, uh, these opportunities are particularly important for making data sets, methods, and metrics so open and interoperable. So having said that, I'm happy to take questions. And of course, I thank you for the invitation and, and for listening to here. Thank you so much, Ithaskun, for your presentation. Um, wonderful talk. I think every scientist needs to listen to you and because benchmarking is, is an important step and every many people doesn't take it so seriously as it should be. And I'm going to ask the, ask the questions from the audience. Uh, Adrian asks, uh, will, it, will it be necessary a benchmark of benchmark benchmarks methods, like benchmark exception? Like benchmarking the benchmarks or? Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, probably. I, for several reasons. Um, I know that some of the benchmarks people publish, they don't, for instance, check whether um, results are stable. They don't run the same method several times. <laughs> and for that, a benchmark uh, would uh, help, a uh, meta benchmark of this, this kind. Maybe it would be good to control for this neutrality, like people really, I don't know, adding data sets that are not fair because they favor their method or their, or probably or put their competitors in trouble or something like that. But rather than benchmarking uh, benchmarks, because there the truth is very hard to know or to simulate, I think the way of uh, we tried, like with meta-analysis, we could also gain a lot of information mm. describing. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he also asks uh, that, uh, I guess all, ben all benchmark methods are, are reproducible, but it is for real. No, that's the thing. What's reproducible anyway? What if uh, in our uh, meta-analysis we, we uh, found that in some cases you didn't even have the software versions <laughs> or you didn't have the code or you didn't... Then can you really think these runs were really real? Meaning if you don't know the parameters, if you don't know the versions, if you don't know the inputs, well, the inputs you normally know, but you don't know the outputs, <laughs> then what can you do? Uh, I agree that uh, this is the reason why we, we need to have an open and transparent platform, I'd say. And not only uh, ours. I mean, there are a couple of out there that are trying, trying to do the same. And I think we all agree this is needed. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Raul asks, how to select the most appropriate data set? Oui, that's a very tricky one. The, the, that's a very tricky one. We, we uh, assume that the, if we enroll people or the community is interested in a benchmark, then the uh, knowledge will be there. So they are going to suggest the real uh, data sets that are needed. Uh, not getting data sets that are too easy or data sets that are too hard is very tricky on one hand. And on the other hand, also simulating data sets in which you know the truth. Because for evaluating performance, you know, need to know the truth, right? It's not also a very easy task. So I don't know. I don't have a real answer for that. I think transparency and having them open would help. At least we'll know what's being put in. And if something looks very fishy, we could take it out. <laughs> but um, we need to, to run the methods on them, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Jose Francisco asks, thank you. Thanks, so, thanks for such a nice presentation. I would like to know how it how is this benchmark strategy perceived by the rest of the scientific community. It, has it been published? Feedback already received? Well, the, that's a fair point uh, and very complex uh, uh, point. Uh, some people, particularly the people running basic research, in my experience, they are not very, they don't understand benchmarking very well. And some people, they even say it's not uh, doing science, right? Because you are not innovating or something like that. So. Some of these feedback have been very, very bad in this regard. But for, for the computational biologists, normally has been very good. 
in some cases, uh, people ask, what do you do with the data sets? Why don't you hide the data sets? So then you have challenges. How do you engage the community? How do you, um, yeah, how do you uh, um, moderate uh, or how do you uh, control that <laughs> that the benchmark is being fair right and for these things to be honest i don't have an answer we we are trying to recruit also people from social, social sciences to do that well in terms of um, feedback like that well we 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 got the funding and that means that at least the the grant reviewers were were positive but um, otherwise uh, i guess we are working why <laughs> i don't have much else to to say uh, positively i mean many people uh, receive the this as a, as a positive uh, uh, endeavor yeah i think i i think it's amazing to have this kind of meta-analysis yeah so i think we have uh, we don't have more questions so uh for to end the presentation I, I i would like to thank you and i'd like to present myself some information of our, our association i'm going to share my screen yes So uh, thank you very much. You can uh, contact uh, Isaskun in, in the information in the in the in our platform, and you can you guys can follow us in the our social network. Uh, we are an association and BioInfo GRX, an association for from Granada, Spain. We mostly do uh, talks in Spanish, but also internationally in English. And we aim to uh, share the, the knowledge of bioinformatics and make some uh, join the bioinformatics with the, with the public. And uh, we have many activities. Uh, we have uh, mini tutorials, uh, workshops. Uh, our next activity will be a, a workshop of tips uh, for data management from Laura Portel. So in uh, the 23 of November. So you can join us. And uh, don't forget to follow us in the social net networks and uh, you can answer a, a, a encuesta, no me sale en inglés. Uh, uh, bueno. Poll? Poll, yeah. <laughs> you can answer a poll that we are going to uh, write uh, the link in the description in the, of the video. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zaskun, for being here. And see you. Thank you. <laughs>